Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So you're going to soon perceive that my rep, uh, my talk is going to be very tangentially related, very tan exceedingly tangentially related to um, to Max's talk, and that in some ways our representationalisms and our anti-representationalisms are actually different. Uh, they're 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 addressing somewhat different problems, of course, because uh, I have nothing to say essentially about, about neural structures so or or how they relate to uh, to representations um, I am also probably going to disappoint Sam a little bit because I'm not going to talk too much about cognitive anthropology either uh, what I am going to talk about today is basically uh, about sort of the history of how representation came to matter for anthropology, sort of the phases that some of the debates went through on that, and then sort of uh, in line with that article that you all read, um, sort of the state of the art with regard to representations and anti-representationalism for uh, socio-cultural anthropology, uh, more so than, say, cognitive anthropology. Um, and in fact, in the end, you might find that our anti-representationalism, or the anti-representationalism that I'm putting forth here, um, doesn't so much run in, in direct contradiction to what Max was saying. Uh, it might, if anything, sort of just run sort of, you know, outside of it or around it. So, um, all right, so we're going to start with, this is sort of the basic line of thing we're going to go, uh, the two orders, world and representation. The space of representations in anthropology, the perspective is corrective, and the two orders reconsidered. So, um, first we're going to start with this, and I think that this is sort of just to lay down a basic idea of how, uh, a basic notion of what representations are or have been for, um, for philosophy, for the history of ideas. And it sort of starts out with uh, this quote from Aristotle in De Interpretazione. He says, um, now spoken, word, or spoken sounds, words, are symbols of affections of the soul, thoughts. And written marks are symbols of spoken sounds. And just as written marks are not the same for all men, or language specific, neither are spoken sounds. But what these are in the first place signs of, affections of the soul, are the same for all, are universal. And what are these... Uh, and what are these affections? What these affections are likeness of, likenesses of actual things are also the same for all men. So uh, I think this is like very. This is actually a very basic view of what I think representation means for a lot of people. It's sort of a common sense notion of what it is. Uh, and implicit in it is to say that so thoughts, which are, rep are representations of the world, language is a representation of thought, and for him it would be speech is a representation of thought, and then. Um, and then uh, uh, written speak or written written words are a representation of spoken words. So you're doing this sort of like epistemic leaps from one thing to the other. Um, and it's sort of implicit in it is that uh, there's sort of a one-to-one -one mapping maybe of these of elements that are linguistic elements to uh, epistemic elements and then to ep elements that are in the world. Um, so, we're going to move on to the two orders themselves. So, this I just put up as a sort of basic thing. I think most people here will recognize this. If anybody doesn't recognize or sort of sees something strange in this, uh, please let me know. But I'll go through it pretty quickly. I mean, we have worlds versus representation, so nature versus culture, matter versus ideas, objects versus subjects, body versus mind. Descent, and I mean this in terms of kinship, so biological descent versus alliance, uh, you decide to marry, or, uh, laws and mechanisms versus rules and norms, necessity versus contingency, intrinsic properties versus relative properties, non-conceptual versus conceptual, and then I put a question mark here because this is probably the hardest one to argue for, and some people would dispute this quite a bit, but ontology is on the side of the world. Epistemology is on the side of the representations, and we have two basically sort of monolithic uh, orders. Now, the categories of the right are generally thought of as uh, supervening on the categories of the left. So, meaning that the categories on the left that you see there are somewhat are like the givens for these categories on the right. Um, now, representationalism is, I, I think, a 
an argument about how this column relates to this column generally. Uh, it's sort of a, a story, some story about how objects out in the world become concepts, you know, for a mind or for a, uh, a subject. And I think in its uh, in its sort of strongest form, it takes the form of Kant's notion of a synthetic a priori cognition, some sort of metaphysically given connection that guarantees that representations will hold, uh, representations of the world will hold, um, and that representations arise and succeed in, capa in virtue of their capacity to mirror the world. Um, and the production of likeness then is their paradigmatic function. That's what representations do. They create likenesses or they express them. So then the question remains uh, about whether the, uh, the relationship between these two orders is best characterized as a product of the world or as a product of our representations about the world. And this is basically, these are the two poles that have decided much of philosophical thought for at least since the Enlightenment and since Kant. And it kind of comes down to, well, are you an idealist? In other words, do you think that all of this has to do with this column? Or do you think that the split between them, or the relationship between them, is, uh, is of the world? Are you a materialist? And that's how the, the, uh, the debate has gone on, and that's what it's meant for anthropology for uh, quite some time. So, now I'm going to move on to the space of representations in anthropology, starting from sort of the very, very beginnings of anthropology, the uh, stodgy men with beards, as I call them. Uh, and uh, so, these stodgy men with beards are very important uh, men. They uh, are basically the founders of what you would call the discipline of anthropology. So we have Herbert Spencer, we have uh, Henry Louis Morgan, we have um, Fraser, James Fraser, and we have uh, my favorite, Edward Burnett Tyler. Um, so, I'm my favorite because he's got the best beard. So, the, in any case, the... Uh, these guys were all uh, sort of unified in having, taking a sort of positivistic view of, 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 of culture and its relationship to nature. You had Spencer who was more of an evolutionist, but all of these guys basically um, centered their research around questions essentially of, okay, so we know that there are representations that are correct. Um, so now the question is, why is it that some people in the world have patently incorrect representations? Why are they, why are they so bad at this? Um, and why are we so good at this by, by, uh, 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 by connection? So they have a lot of cognitive, they'll have various cognitive, sociological, technological, and of course, most notoriously racial explanations that they advance in order to explain these um, differences. And then until we come to our cultural hero, especially in North America, Boaz, he's even got a nice smile. He's so much more kind of genial looking, ditch the beard. Um, and cultural relativism comes into play. So, one of the things that he does is that, you know, points out inconsistencies uh, in the positivist view or the unilineal evolutionary story, namely that often societies don't go from more simple to more complex, and that this will change depending on what, I mean, it depends of, uh, on what features you're talking about as well, what cultural features. So, sometimes they move in the opposite direction, and so for him, representations are now treated as uh, psychological facts that serve to organize uh, experience, but they're viewed as highly context-dependent, and with the context themselves at least uh, resistant to commensuration. So what I mean by that is that that would be the relativist part of this, right? We have to think about it according to the context of the values of the culture that these representations occur in, and those values might be at least radically different or resistant to uh, comparison with other sets of values. Um, so what becomes interesting in this, uh, on this account are second order er interpretations of representations, as well as the lacuna that, that might arise in these, uh, in these interpretations. So in other words, what I mean by second order representation, just basically, or second order interpretation, just the very basic thing that anthropologists are very good at doing, going out, well, why do you do that? You know, why do you use, uh, why do you do X ritual? Why do you use X linguistic convention, right? Um, 
But it's really important to point out, and this is something that Boaz was very aware of, and something that uh, his disciples as well, especially um, Sapir, who was uh, one of his students, um, it's important to point out that those lacuna are also bound to be present in the anthropologist's own interpretation, right? We bring our own blind spots to the whole, to the whole deal. And as uh, Sapir once said, uh, I love this quote, he says, one is always unconsciously finding what one is in unconscious subjection to. So this is a very strange idea if you bring this into the, the, realm, uh, the domain of interpretation. Um, and then finally, that ends up somewhat with the Sapir Whorf hypothesis, how language, and we might add cultural, culture more generally, determines uh, thought or cognition. Right? So from there, I think that this basic uh, approach to representations went in two big, very different directions in, in anthropology. Uh, in one direction, it went to uh, cognitive anthropology, or cognitivist anthropology. And uh, Sam, you can correct me if I'm being unfair here, but my characterization of cognitivist anthropology would be to say that what they're looking for is, to, is, is the object is to sort of establish uh, what are the cognitive schema that in turn are sort of serve as the necessary minimum required for an account of, of widely distributed cultural features. So we see, uh, so they're very interested basically in that idea of what I got back to with Aristotle, the spiritual unity, the cognitive unity is what we would now say instead of spiritual unity, but it amounts to the same thing. Um, and I guess another, another factor, this is more of a sort of uh, disciplinary politics factor, um, is that it views itself as much more of a scientific enterprise uh, often um, as opposed to the interpretivist anthropology, which is exemplified by people like Clifford Geertz, um, and is much more involved in actually looking at sort of what do representations mean to the people who use them. Right, that, that's the much more important question for them. Um, and it becomes, and they're much more leery of making claims about universals or even undertaking a comparativist project at all, right? So it's a very different approach in that regard. Um, now I want to uh, sort of show though how actually, though these might seem very different um, positions, they actually share some representationalist assumptions, uh, very important ones. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we have on the other side, this is now the sort of the postmodern viewpoint, which is sort of the, acute, the, the culmination of the interpretivist framework. And it sort of has this idea that, it's sort of a vague idea that representations are all that there really, that there really is, right? It's a very idealist in that sense. Uh, and it's exemplified by people, usually by opponents, not by, you know, proponents. Uh, at, by things like Foucault's notion that life was invented and, you know, he says life was invented through enlightenment discourse, in, in enlightenment discourse, or Latour's statement that certain diseases could not have existed prior to their nosology, so prior to them being classified uh, as diseases. Um, so, I want to look at this quote, though, just to show, because this is Michael Tose, who might be, like, the worst offender of some sort of a postmodern interpretivist anthropology in some ways. Um, and to what degree we still find a sort of very strong representationalist account. So he is explaining something about magic at this point, but he takes this little aside and he says, elementary physics and physiology might instruct us that the two features, these two features of copy and contact are steps in the same process. That array of light, for example, moves from the rising sun into the human eye where it makes contact with the retinal rods and comes to, and retinal rods and cones to form, via the circuits of the central nervous system, a culturally attuned copy of the rising sun. That's from uh, my thesis in Alterity, he wrote that in 85, I wanna say? Maybe later. In any case, oh, 93, rather. Uh, so, I think there's one thing, there's a few problems here that we're gonna have to deal with. Uh, one is sort of, uh, you know, if it is a copy indeed that sort of arises in the mind, but we know that there are, infi there are potentially infinite number of ways of producing a copy, uh, then what it ha in what sense is it still meaningful to call them copies in the sense of grabbing something essential out of what, uh, what they're copying, 
Uh, and then also the other point, which I think he acknowledges more, it's, a, it's just really at what point does contact become copy? It seems like we have just sets of contact. We have points of contact between here, the light, the eye, optic nerves, then circuits of the central nervous system, and then it's all of a sudden, boom, copy, comes up at the other end. It's as if it sort of went underground and then came up. Um, and I think uh, he actually says that the distinction between copy and contact is fundamental. He goes on to say that, but we should really ask, be asking fundamental for what? Uh, why is that fundamental? Um, and I think that uh, Vivero Castro points it out quite nice when he characterizes these two, uh, Eduardo Vivero Castro characterizes the two sides here, and it was in the article that, it, that I assigned. He says, well, on the one side we have the, the, the cognitivists, well, we have the interpretivists who want to reduce reality to representations, and we have the cognitivists who want to reduce uh, representations to reality, right? So we want a third way out of this, uh, out of this choice between being always either an idealist or a materialist. Um, and I think that perspectivism offers us this. So this is the perspectivist corrective. This is First, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'll talk about Amerindian perspectivism, um, and, but first I'm going to talk about perspectivism in general, because it also has wider sort of philosophical applications. Um, I think, in general, you could say that perspectivism, and especially this will be the case for Vivero Castro, is a theory of intersecting realities, right? Each one of which is, uh, each reality is given simultaneously with a set of affects, i.e. a body, and uh, that co-determines uh, a space of interactional variables, right? So the affects of my body determine what's going to appear, just as much as the things in my field are also going to be determine how I can interact with them, right? So interaction is co-determined by, on the one hand, a body, on the other hand, the world that that body sort of gives on to, right? Um, so what we would say there is that a body's relations are, in some sense, rely logically prior to what a body is. If we want to ask what a body is, first we have to ask about the relations that it has to other bodies. Um, as opposed to a substantialist notion where we would just know because the body is identical with itself and we would start with identity and then move out toward the relation. Okay, so Amerindian perspectivism uh, and this is going to get uh, a little dense, is the view that each reality corresponds to a specific human or non-human uh, collective and is expressed via an embodied anthropomorphic point of view so that humanity is in the possession of the common denominator, the, I'm quoting here from Pivetra Castro, the reflexive mode of the collective. So we have different bodies basically because we belong to different uh, collectives, right? When, if I'm a jaguar, I have a jaguar body. If I'm a Shadanoa, I have a Shadanoa body. But if I'm a Yaminoa, I have a Yaminoa body, right? These are, these are all, uh, it puts sort of uh, interspecific and what we would think of as sort of intercommunal differences on the same level, the same plane. Um, or intercultural differences, we could say. They're on the same plane. This means that every being in the Amerindian cosmos sees itself as human but the world that they see is modulated according to their body's position on a continuum of affects, characteristic of each species or collective. A typical example of this is how a jaguar will see as a manioc beer, or something like, you know, nutritive substance, what a human would see as blood, uh, which is, of course, our vital substance, what we need to... And this is analogous in the way that uh, kinship relations work. Right? So they're determined by one's relative position within a sociological network, but the relation themselves are, are real and objective. Right? So my mother may be my uncle's sister, and my mother for me, but it's objectively true that she is my mother. This is an example also that Vivir Castro uses. So I think this is a question that Max was always asking me, and I think it's a good one. How is this an anti-representational stance? Or why does it require or in some sense entail anti-representationalism? I think uh, what we need to oppose here, if we think back to the two orders that I put up, is sort of uh, changes in representations, or changes in knowledge, we would sometimes characterize that as, taken as an ideal 
operation. It's something that happens in the mind. It's something that happens between ideas. It's how ideas are related. Versus a, a, a perspectival transformation, right? Which is a change in your body. And it's a real operation whose status uh, as ideal or material is strictly undecidable. It's both material and ideal. It has no uh, strict um, associations with one or the other. So pers for perspectivism, we could say there are no things in themselves, only relations in themselves. Uh, what is at stake in cultural practices is not how to best represent the external world, then, uh, or how, how best to do that um, in a, some sort of context-independent sense, but how those practices will alter the space of interactional variables by altering the space of bodily capacities. So in other words, as you change my, if in a, by gauging in a practice, I change my point of view, I change my body, I change my, connect, I change my world. It all is connected so that knower, the activity of knowing and, and what is known are constantly sort of locked in so that any change in one will trigger a change in the others. Um, such changes are rooted in what we might call then the affective dynamics of an interactional space. So how bodily capacities co-vary with the capacity of other interactants to be affected, right? So there's a, the, there's a distinct covariance between what my body is and what I can do, but also what can be done on the part of uh, other interactants, or how they can be affected. So it's important to recognize how in characterizing such practices as cultural, or, or, or when we call these cultural practices, when we call these sort of representations, um, when we treat them almost as metaphors or symbols, uh, a lot of what we're doing is translating them into a game, uh, I would say a game of inferential justification, which is our game, but it's not the same game. We have to be very conscious of the way in which it's not the same game as the, as the ones that the practitioners themselves are playing. Um, so finally, going back to the two orders reconsidered, and I'm going to end actually on a more uh, conciliatory note toward representationalism, but uh, I think, <clears throat> and I had this done before, instead of looking at these two monolithic orders as sort of separated by a divide between them, I think it's better to think, imagine sort of horizontal lines going across and each sort of coupling being set off from the others. And uh, instead of uh, looking at them as sort of either my materialist or idealist, um, we look at them as uh, a set of analogies. So the, the way that we know something about re how representations relate to the world is directly dependent on how we know something about how culture relates to nature. These are all sort of analogies of each other in some way. Uh, what I like about this is then you can sort of see that the analogies themselves are not metaphysically given, but they're emergent, context-dependent, and importantly, contestable, right? Um, and each pair then can be viewed as a, uh, as a continuum of sort of mutually determinate relative contrasts, as opposed to two different things. So think tall versus short, not good versus evil, right? So tall versus short, you don't need a principle of tallness or a principle of shortness in order to make sense of those, of those properties. Um, most importantly, I think we should view these as uh, pragmatic terms um, within a game of, of, uh, of, we could say within a language game, we could say within a, a game of inferential justifications, as long as we keep in mind that I'm not talking about something that's only about ideas, I'm talking about something that's about practices, that's about capacities as well. Um, and. I think we should think about how these terms then make a difference for our practices, not for an abstract notion of truth, not for an abstract account or from the view from nowhere about uh, where we need to place these in our metaphysics. Uh, and by practice then, in that case, I mean the instrumenta uh, instrumentalization of our capacities to affect and be affected right, by interactants. Um, and as an anthropologist, and I think this is the most important thing for me in, in anthropology, as an anthropologist, I would seek to account for these contrasts by ways that situate them within a space of ethical and aesthetic possibilities as well, right? Uh, I don't want, I'm not, uh, and I think that that's ultimately what's important about a perspectivist account. Um, so for instance, if we think about these two categories, these two sort of orders again, and we think about them in terms of what can be controlled and what cannot be controlled, 
and we think about that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, a legal or juridical framework. I think we get something uh, sort of more interesting, more enriching uh, for, uh, for anthropological research. Um, so finally, is there no place for representations then in, in, in this account? Um, I would say that with the ontological turn, and this is in the article that, that you've read, that there is actually a real threat of throwing out the baby with the bathwater of the linguistic, return, uh, linguistic turn if we simply decide to excise representations from our theoretical vocabulary altogether. Like we just say, okay, we're never gonna refer, uh, we're never gonna refer to them again. So for one thing, I think representations may be held to confer capacities in just as real a manner as say, like going to the gym. Like, you know, I think representations, particularly in the count that Max is giving, it's not, uh, as long as we don't think of them as sort of essentially ideal operations that have everything to do with subjects and knowledge and nothing to do with, uh, except indirectly, with the world or with, with matter, uh, then, we're, then we're fine. So I think that uh, representations can have a role to play in our causal accounts, but it should not be as a, as a kind of epistemic mediary. It shouldn't be as a way of sort of just jumping from world to concepts to language to uh, whatever else, to, uh, from speech to writing, I suppose. So finally, what is important then is not that we treat uh, representations in exclusively or even primar primarily ideal terms, but that we see them as irreducibly both embodied and embedded and as a sort of, sort of slight corrective to, to to what Max was saying, as at least somewhat medium dependent, as medium dependent perhaps in ways that that will be uh, that that are um, that count for more than what we than what a strictly representationalist account might imagine. Um, that's it. <laughs>